I think we're back. Hello, we're back. It's kind of nice to see my audio meter working on this thing now. They must have fixed that over at Facebook. We're back. It's time for our Facebook Live uh, Romans a book study and a Bible study. And let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who will be coming in. I ask you to be with us as we study your word. I ask you to, uh, to give people good questions and good observations and just guide us through this time. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I don't know if anybody's here yet. We are in Romans 4.19. Um, I'm writing in, in Romans 5 now. It's a lot more fun to write Romans 5 than it is uh, to go through Romans 1 through 4. But it's important. We need to have the background and we need to know this material. Um, let me go to Romans 4, my Bible program. All right. So he's talking about Abraham, and he starts talking about Abraham in verse 13. And so he says, For the promise that Abraham would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his, his, to his seed through the law, not just his uh, people that came after him, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who have the law are heirs, Faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath, for where is no law, there is no transgression. In verse 16, he said, Therefore it is of faith to be the heir of the world, that, that it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Why? So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who have the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So not just Jewish people who followed the law, but anyone who has faith in the Lord. He says in verse 17, as it's written, I've made your father of many nations. So that means to him, um, many more people groups. And so that includes Gentile people groups, too. In the presence of him who in me believe, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, this is Abraham, to contrary to hope, in hope believed. So even if he couldn't see anything to be joyfully expecting, he joyfully expected that God would do what he said, and he believed in him, he had trust in him, so he became, just like God said, the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your dependence be. So, um, hopefully this is going out. It's hard to tell. I don't have anybody coming in, but sometimes it's that way. Today is a holiday in the United States. It's Columbus Day. And so some of the people are probably... Um, just not coming to the Bible study. But that's okay. We keep moving on. So let me close that. Do this. He says, Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken by God. So shall your descendants be. And now we get into Romans 4, 19, which says this. I will paste it. And not being weak in faith. So Abraham was not weak in faith. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Who already did, since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he never really thought about it because God said, I'm going to give you all these descendants. Now in context, 
He was 100 years old, and his wife was about the same age, so they were both well past um, the time in their lives where they could expect to make a baby. There was no earthly basis for this hope. However, there was a heavenly basis for it, so he had hope anyway. Why? Well, Paul said it because he was not weak in faith. Faith is only as good as the object of our faith. And it benefits us to put our faith on the Lord, put our focus on the Lord and his abilities rather than the limitations on the earthly, even our own limitations, which are, are just, there's plenty of them. There's plenty of things that tell us why we physically or in an earthly sense can't do something, but often God will tell us it's going to happen. So it's going to happen. You know, I've had people, I had two people that I pastored. One of them went on, well, she had a, a bachelor's degree in psychology. And uh, she got let go from her job. And it looked like nothing, like there was no hope. Like she wouldn't be able to pay her rent or anything. And so I took her out to eat. And then we came to sit in my office. And we prayed. And the Lord told her, that she was going to go back to school, and there was no hope of this. It's just that we couldn't see where the money was going to come from or anything, but she was going to get a master's in social work degree. And sure enough, despite all the limitations, she has been serving our community for about 10 years now as an MSW, working with um, uh, uh, CPS. Child Protective Services, and serving a community by helping children uh, have as normal a life as they can, training parents to be good parents and, and to live for their children. Another one the Lord told was going to be a nurse, and it looked like there was no way that was going to happen. And she has been serving as a, a LVN, a, a licensed vocational nurse, for about the same amount of time now, and maybe the first one's been doing this 15 years, um, where it looked like there was no hope, uh, but but God provided for tuition, living expenses, and everything they needed to do this. We just have to take our eyes off the earthly limitations if God says he's going to do something. And if he says he's going to do something, he's going to do something. If he does, there's a heavenly basis for it. So, we must, we must remember, Abraham was aware of his, hey, Liz, it's good to see you. I hope I'm coming in okay. I'm glad to see you here. I was wondering if anybody was going to tune in at all. Thank you. Uh, we must remember that Abraham was aware of the limitations that he and Sarah had physically. It's hard to ignore the fact by age 100 that most people won't be making any more babies. Still, his faith in the Lord was stronger than the rec his recognition of this earthly limitation. I think that's beautiful. I, I wish we could live that way. I know we can. I wish we would. So he and Sarah tried to have a baby, and they acted on his faith, despite how unlucky it must have been likely it must have seemed that it would be successful due to their ages. And the scripture is clear that Sarah didn't share that. Apparently she submitted to his advances, but she didn't, she didn't believe it was going to happen. She thought it was a foolish idea. And so earthly limitations can be numerous, but, but God makes things happen. When we run across, thank you, thank you, Liz, for letting me know, because I have no way of gauging it with the way Facebook works now. Um, whenever we have someone among us that the Lord definitely, we believe the Lord definitely said something, we have to help them direct their focus to God and his promise and not on and away from any earthly limitations. Colossians 3 1 to 2 says this. Remember that if here can also mean since. It 
since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Now, I know we have to navigate the things of the earth. Tax season and, you know, traffic laws and all the stuff, things that are happening on the earth. Um, tomorrow we'll be talking in our early morning show. Charlie and I are going to discuss the, um, the brutal attacks that uh, the Muslim terrorist group Hamas inflicted on innocent people in Israel. And we're going to talk about uh, our thoughts on that and what our prayers are. And I hope people um, tune in. But we can't approach that from a simply earthly viewpoint. Because we're spiritual beings. We're eternal spiritual beings. So if God tells a lady, you're someday going to be a nurse. So we kept telling her, God said it. So one day you're going to be a nurse. And the other one is one day you're going to have a master's in social work. It's just the way it is. If God says it, then we begin to participate in that. And they did their part. They showed up at school. They studied. They sacrificed, and other people pitched in to help them through that to, you know, to, to, um, to gain that new position in life and, and new income. So that person who was going to be a nurse listened and focused on the promise. She did her part despite the discouraging earthly reasons she might fail. Because in that time, you know, her car broke down, uh, she needed gas money, she got sick, all that stuff. Life stuff happened. But she's worked many years as a nurse now. And as a nurse, she has ministered Jesus to many people, even when it had to be a little bit undercover. Because some of these places don't let you be blatant about your faith in the Lord. Even though if it wasn't for her faith, she wouldn't even be there. And I just want everybody to hear this. Anybody listening to this, live or in a video, anyone can do their own version of what she did. We just have to seek God, believe him, act on his promise and on what he has said. So if he says it, it's going to be true. Now, when I was back in Houston working in a counseling center and doing prison ministry, and it looked like I was going to be there forever, the Lord showed me living rooms in which I was going to have, um, be, you know, doing ministry in people's homes. Some of them were living rooms I didn't see. And before we moved from Houston, I took a trip to St. Louis, and I knew God told me this was going to be happening, and we were going to have a house church meeting in a home, Tony and Carol Knight's home in the Saint, Metro St. Louis. And as I stepped on the threshold, they'll remember this, I looked at him and I said, can I describe the inside of your house? And I knew what it looked like having never been there. Why? Because God said. God said I would be in places like this. I knew some of the faces of people that would be coming because they invited them, never having met those people. Some of them I knew from a Bible study I did online, but I didn't know what they looked like. They knew what I looked like because I had a web page with my mug on it, you know. But um, but that's the way it works. Anyone can encourage someone like we encourage that woman who's an LVN now and the one who is now an MSW, Master in Social Work, by keeping their focus on the heavenly and not so much on the things of the earth. Meanwhile, working it all out in the physical. Anyone can be that team member for someone else. We just have to be around and pay attention and love them enough to do that. So 19 said, and not being weak in faith, Abraham did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, and he didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb because she was almost his age. I think she was 99. And then in verse 20, it says this about Abraham. Bonsoir, Marie Chagnon. I hope all is well up north. 
says, Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He was strengthened in faith. Look at how the complete Jewish Bible puts this verse. I, I like to use Jewish, complete Jewish Bible a lot because sometimes it just says things so plainly. It says, he did not waver at the promise of, no, oops. Um, oops, it didn't copy it for me. Let me try it again. Sometimes my copy doesn't work in Word. I'm sorry this is bulky, but this is what I have to do. He did not, by lack of trust, decide against God's promises. On the contrary, by trust, he was given power as he gave glory to God. There's four words for power in, uh, in the Greek of the New Testament. And one of them has to do with being strength, but he was given faith power. By trust, he was given power as he gave glory to God. You know, built into that, when you look at the complete Jewish Bible version, that meant that, that even after deciding to try, Abraham had to make decisions to believe. He had to make decisions to believe. And I think anytime we set out to do something, we believe the Lord would have us do. And all those roadblocks, those earthly impediments come up we need to re, re you know reassert that in our minds that god said it so it's going to happen it's going to happen when we came here and and I, I walked up to the guy who rents to me here i i really rented this room and that room which were um separate by a wall at the time and i had zero dollars for rent I mean, we really had nothing in the budget to do it, but the Lord was telling me to build a, a counseling place here in, in Wise County, Texas, where we live in North Texas. And he said, well, when are you going to move in? I said, well, we don't actually have the, the rent yet. And he goes, really? And I said, yeah, but I believe the Lord will provide it. Hey, Paul Terry, it's good to see you. Hey, John McCory, good to see you too from Kenya. Um, so, so uh, I'll do that at the end of the Bible study there, John. Um, but I knew he wanted me to do it, so I didn't know how it was going to happen. I also knew the Lord told me not to solicit income for anything we do. So I just prayed, and I expected the Lord would do what he said he was going to do. He was going to build this, this place, which meant I needed a phone, and I needed a desk. I needed a whole bunch I needed the furniture, and I mean, I literally sent out a a um, newsletter, put it in the mailbox, and in it I was asking for a like a bluish gray sofa, because if anybody came, they were going to need to sit somewhere. I had a chair to sit in, I still have it here, and um, I got a phone call coming back from the post office. And the guy said, I have a sofa. Do you know anybody needs it? And it was his mother. She had passed away. And so um, so I had a sofa. And I think the Lord assembled what we needed because he said he would do it. He was strengthened by faith. You know, there are many believers that kind of go on a sort of order, on like an auto um not right now, John, because I'm teaching a Bible study live, and we can do that sometime if you want, but right now I'm dedicating this time to doing what, you know, we do every Monday night. Um, but sure, I'll talk to you about it later. Um, I can't do an inbox and teach and listen to the Holy Spirit of God at the same time. Um, friend request me if we're not already friends. Um, there are many believers who kind of go on a sort of autopilot and they use Christianese. It's this Christian language that we've developed. It's not biblical at all. And we use catchphrases like some religions use, so-called, like some use holy metals and relics 
and they just blurred out glory to God and praise the Lord um, and they never seem to think any of it through they just say these things Abraham chose in contrast to think it all through and willingly willingly he made a decision to give God give glory to God simply because God promised him something and the result was that God caused him to be strengthened in faith, according to Romans 4.20. We know of congregations in which members are encouraged to shout out man-made chants in which they, they, claim, they proclaim they're going to build up their own faith on their own, in their own puny strength. Hey, Tom Benson, it's good to see you. The people are led to believe that they can make themselves become spiritual giants by doing this. They're being misled, often by misguided leadership who saw somebody else do it and thought it was spiritually cute or something they can use to look more spiritual. Here in Romans 4.20, we see something completely different. We see a more sound and biblical approach to increasing one's faith outside of proclaiming it in your own strength. Utilizing whatever faith we have, even if it's a little bit of belief in God. And then experiencing the Lord, the Lord to cause that to grow. I think I trust that second one more than trusting myself in man-made chants maybe got off of some website somewhere, to increase my faith in God. How about you? Romans 4.20 again says, Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Then we go to the next verse. Verse 21. And how was Abraham able to do this? How was he able to do this? Being fully convinced that, it, that what he, God had promised, he, God, was also able to perform. Abraham was fully convinced that whatever God promises he can do, you know, otherwise, that God can do whatever God promises to do. Otherwise, God would not have promised it in the first place. Here is how the Amplified Bible puts it. And then, you know, Amplified Bible often will really nail something down. Fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and do what he had promised. There are several books on the market. You can buy them on Amazon and at Christian book distributors and other places about God's promises. And what people do is they read them and then they pick the ones that seem to appeal to them the most and they write them down and memorize them. And the question I have is, do we believe God really means these things? Or do we just kind of hope God might do them? And I ask this because most believers seem to not have a whole lot of confidence in God. And I hate saying that. I hate that it's true. When we get into chapter 5, I'm going to talk about hope uh, in depth. Because it means a whole lot more than like, I hope, I hope I, God will do it. I really hope. And if God says it, he really will. And then we either need to get behind it or we need to quit saying we believe him. Abraham was fully convinced. That's what the scripture says. That whatever God promises, he can do. It might be beneficial for us to spend some time meditating on the goodness of God. And on his faithfulness, 
And let's decide for sure whether or not we believe that and we'll choose to trust him. I mean, to me, he's, he's the only choice there is, you know. John Gill, in his exposition of the Bible, which is one of the, the um, one of the, um, what's it called? Commentaries that I trust. He says this. He says, not because his faith was strong and he had a full assurance of it, but because it was right, resting on the promise of God and relying on God's power and faithfulness to perform it. For though the righteousness of faith is not imputed to any sort of believers, not to mere nominal ones, yet to all such as have true faith, though it may be but weak, for faith as to nature kind and object, object though not as to degree it's the same in all believers and the same righteousness is imputed to one as to another we get the same faith we can never forget that it's all about the Lord it's not about us even though he does he does grant us things he just blesses us so much And that's why it says this in Romans 4, 20 through 22. I put them all together. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness, his his belief, his being fully convinced. Do you want to be righteous like Abraham? Choose to believe God. Read through the things he says and take them to heart. Try to live according to what he says to do. Now moving on to verses 23 to 24. Today we're covering a lot more ground than we usually do. Never forget, that's all about the Lord, not us. Now, it was not written for Abraham's sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, the Father who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. This is what Paul has been working up to all this time, all through chapter 4, that we share righteousness with Abraham because in Christ, we are righteous. Now, there are people among us in the body of Christ who think that it's prideful to say that. Because, you know, they're aware, as you and I are, that we're not, that not everything we do is righteous. Not every thought we have is righteous. I'm not talking about our performance. I'm talking about our identity. That God gave us a new identity in Christ, and that identity in Christ is righteous. Now, how can I say such a thing? Well, because the Scripture says it. I'm going to break it down so we know which he and which him this refers to. It's out of 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, the Father, made him Jew, new who Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, some versions say to become sin, on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus. So the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Hey, Stacy, never apologize for showing up. We're glad you're here. For he, the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. So we're righteous in Christ. Imagine that. Imagine way back 
when God pronounced Abraham to be righteous due to his faith, he knew that someday you would have faith in Jesus and he would say the same thing about you and for the same reason. Because you would be faithful in the Lord too. Isn't that cool? God always has us in mind. So we're going to break down Romans 4, 23 and 24 a little bit more. And look at the second half of that, the verse 24. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, right here it says that Father God did. And there are two other places which say this too. In Acts 2, 22 to 24, Peter says it. in his famous speech on Pentecost. If you don't believe the Holy Spirit can transform a person, read that speech. Um, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, and I want to tell you, if, if God does a miracle through you, or wonders or signs, you ain't doing them. God does them through you. You can allow it, you can participate, but we don't work miracles. I, at one time, I led a guy to Christ in this room, or the Holy Spirit drew him to the to the Lord, and I baptized him in a in a hotel swimming pool down the street. And when I did, all his family was there, and I was horrified when he said, "Mike saved me." And I did, and I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, Mike doesn't save anybody. Jesus saved you. I just prayed with you, you know, men of Israel, hear these words: Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by determined purpose and foreknowledge of knowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death." whom God raised up, there it is, the Father raised him up, having loosened the pains of death because it was not possible that he would be held by it or imprisoned by it or kept by it. Also, Paul said that the Father raised him from the dead. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through man, but through Jesus Christ and the Father who raised him from the dead. We also know that the Bible says, just to make sure we're being complete, that Holy Spirit also raised Jesus from the dead. So, let's quote that verse. It's out of Romans. We'll see this later in Romans 8. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the spirit of the Father who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Holy Spirit who dwells in you. The spirit of him, the spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. So it stands to reason because God is spirit Son and, and Father. So why didn't Jesus raise himself? Because he took the form of a man and released himself of all his glory for those 33 years. He needed God and the Father and God the Spirit to raise him from the dead. He says, Gee, he's still speaking about Jesus here. So I'm going to quote Verses 23 and 24 of Romans 4 again. And then I'm going to do verse 25. 
because he's still talking about Jesus. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. This is a beautiful statement that I've studied this many times and it jumped out at me this time. In this, Paul alludes to a process. In the first part, it says, Jesus is delivered up because of our offenses, which means that something happened to Jesus because of something we did, because we sinned. Now, the word delivered is a Greek word. I'm going to just quote this whole paragraph that I wrote because I think it's a pretty paragraph. He was delivered up because of our offenses. The word delivered in the Greek is a Greek word paradidomai. And it means to turn someone over or something over to another to have power over him. It's as if the father said, take Jesus instead. And you know, that's exactly what the father did. Let Jesus experience the power of death, spiritual death, and not you. In the second part of this verse, it says, Jesus is raised because of our justification which refers to the process of God declaring us to be right or righteous in Jesus. So out of Albert Barnes' notes from the, on the Bible, I have this quote about justification. It says, it's for he was raised because of our justification. The word justification here seems to be used in a large sense to denote acceptance with God, including not merely the formal act by which God pardons sins and by which we become reconciled to him, but also the completion of the work, the treatment of us as righteous, raising us up to a state of glory. You ever think about that? I really don't think about being in a state of glory as a born-again person. Do you? It's just not something I generally wrap my head around, but I've been thinking about it now since I wrote these words. Let's make sure we get this. The resurrection doesn't just bring us life, although it does. It restores everything lost by Adam in the garden when Adam fell. It, it brings back the completion of the work. We're complete in Jesus. And that's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It's because it meant the completion of all things intended. Well, we're gonna stop here for now. That was the last verse of Romans chapter four. Um, we're going to pray in a second. Um, I want to uh, pray for, let's see, where was that? Um, somebody posted some stuff in the middle of the Bible study. John McCory, I think his name is pronounced, has an orphanage in Kenya. They have the orphan, all, all the usual needs that every orphanage on the earth has food and shelter and clothing and education. And I appreciate that people all around the world, um, it's about the fourth uh, orphanage I know of um, in, in Mexico and in various places in, in Africa. Um, it's a worthy calling and it's a hard calling. Uh, we're also gonna pray for Israel and for um, safety for the hostages um, seized by Hamas uh, murderers and torturers who, um, who are going to kill them because they're women and children and not their kind of Muslim. So uh, we hope they don't. We, I saw some were, were rescued this week, um, today, 
and the terrorists put down, and I appreciate that. Um, but they are fixing to do a land war in Gaza, and that means that the terrorists who, in a cowardly way, use uh, innocent women, children, and men as human shields are going to have those get killed so they can trot their their um, bodies out and use them uh, for gullible um, mainstream media. We have to decide what we're going to believe. So I pray that we will believe truth, that we trust uh, Netanyahu and the leaders of Israel to to try their best to not hurt people, unlike the Hamas people who beheaded innocent people at a peace celebration um, on Saturday, on, on a, a holy day in uh, Israel. So we're going to pray, and then I have some announcements to make like I always do. So Father God, we lift up uh, Brother McCory's, um hopefully your, uh, your orphanage there in Kenya, and I ask you to bless them with the things they need, with food, shelter, um, clothing, educational needs, and uh, we thank you that someone's taking care of these children. I ask you to bless them. I ask you to bless my friend down in uh, Mexico, in Reynosa, who does the same thing, and others in other African countries and South American countries who are taking care of the children. Uh, we praise you for that. We thank you that people sacrifice their lives for that. We ask you to be with the uh, grieving and uh, all around the world, including those who lost American lives um, this weekend because of the unprovoked attack of Hamas, um, militant Muslims who um, are willing to obey Allah um, and disobey what the scripture says about um, not killing innocent people, um, which they say they believe, but they really don't. I ask you to be with the victims' families and with the leaders in Israel who are scrambling to get on top of the situation and to uh, ensure that Hamas is wiped from the face of the earth. I ask you to bless us, Father, in all of our endeavors. I thank you that you allow the scriptures to be here. I thank you for people who, be, who become a part of the Bible study through comments, through uh, attendance, through sharing the Bible study with others, and through support in what we do financially, and through prayer and enthusiasm. And I ask you to, um, to bless them. I thank you for this. I ask you to be with us as we go into our radio show shortly on um, TruthSeekerTexasRadio.com. And I ask you to be with us and bring us back together next time. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, remember, um, you can always look at these videos on our YouTube channel, which is easiest to find by hitting this link on our ministry's website, Mike McInerney Ministries. Um, there's also a virtual wealth of uh, articles on that website, um, majority of which were I wrote. Um, we also every, every day post a word from the proverb of the day. Today is the ninth, so it was out of Proverbs 9. Also, um, we also have a radio station, a streaming radio station in the room in the back. Uh, this is the link for it. Uh, tonight, we're not going to have a live show. We're going to have a pre-recorded show, but I encourage you to listen to it. It is um, my good friend and brother, Pastor Michael Newman. Uh, who has he's got? He's agreed to do four shows for us on the topic of uh, same-sex attraction and gender confusion. Michael, um, in the first one two months ago, uh, spoke of his own um, um, recovery of his true heterosexual um, orientation through Christ, uh, who has restored him to uh, manhood, to biblical manhood. And they talked about how that happened, how he slipped into the homosexual lifestyle, and how God rescued him. He also talked about his ministry, 
which is um, CCR Ministry in Houston Christian um, Coalition for Reconciliation, in which he helps others struggle with sexual issues and with um, gender confusion. Uh, the second one, uh, he talked about four different approaches that the world and the church use and how three of them are not biblically sound and how the one that he and his, um, 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 uh, let's see, um, let's see, I'm typing out the name of this. He's a part of this network, his ministry is a part of Hope, Restored Hope Network, and it, it, uh, these are people who also address identity and attraction, <coughs> as well as homosexual behavior, and, um, and same-sex attraction, and, and also gender uh, confusion and transgender issues. Um, they talk about how God restores identities, and so, very good. Tonight's show is going to be about how to approach somebody <coughs> to help them uh, with these issues. How to do so, <coughs> excuse me, in a um, sensitive but biblically sound way. How to love our neighbor, maybe even a relative, uh, by addressing these things. Uh, not dragging anybody kicking and screaming to, um, to be counseled but to just talk to them and love them and be a part of their life and ask them how they got to this point in their life. It's really good. It's, it's a little bit over an hour and it's well worth listening to. I will be posting these on YouTube and I will also be posting them on Spotify. <coughs> He's got one more to record and it's going to have to do with how do you approach a loved one who is uh, struggling with same-sex attraction or gender confusion. For right now, though, I'll let you go. I love you. I have to uh, make sure the radio is all set up. And then um, see you next time. If you have any questions about any of this, you can go to the website, mikemac.org, and um, there's a link that you can email me. God bless you. I hope I'll be talking to you, John McCory, sometime soon. And um, I hope you all come back next time. Thank you for being a part of this Bible study. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.